Okay, it is seven o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Writer's Workshop. My name is Salim. I will be serving as your host tonight and will help navigate questions. Our topic tonight is Embracing the Child's Eye, Writing for Children and Teens, presented by author Sarah Aronson. Before I introduce Sarah, um, I do want to give a few updates about the library. So we are open um, to the public and offering kind of a grab and go model. This is where you can come in, browse the shelves, um, grab your held items and um, use your computer for two hours a day if needed. Um, if you don't feel coming in, uh, comfortable coming into the library just yet, that's okay. Um, we did continue our curbside delivery service. Uh, this is where you can request items at home and pick them up in front of the library. Uh, for more information on that, you can visit champagne.org slash curbside. If you have questions for staff, uh, there are a few ways you can reach out to us. Um, you can book a librarian. Um, that's where we schedule a consultation with one of our experts at champagne.org slash book a librarian. Uh, you can chat with us anytime the library is open. Our chat feature is located on our website at the bottom of the page. And you can email us at librarian at champagne.org. Um, I also want to share um, some information about um, a campus and community uh, focused collaboration titled Pandemics as a Portal to Change, presented by Cranert Art Museum. Um, I will include the link in the chat. Um, it is a public call for creativity, um, including writing, visual arts, original music, and video. And uh, they're inviting the community and students to take one of our current struggles um, and imagine how we might make a change and reimagine our world. Um, I'm sharing this here since writing is one of the areas um, of creative work that they are seeking. So I will include that link in the chat um, with more information about the submission requirements and the deadline, which is April 19th. Um, I'd also like to share a few instructions for communicating through Zoom tonight. So depending on um, on your device at the bottom of the screen, you should see the option uh, to chat, which will allow you to type um, your questions in. Next to that is the option to raise your hand um, and I can unmute you if you prefer to use your microphone. Um, Sarah will be answering questions throughout her presentation. So with that said, I'd like to now introduce our presenter. Sarah Aronson earned an MFA in writing for children and young adults from Vermont College of Fine Arts and published three standalone novels, Headcase, Beyond Lucky, and Believe, along with the Wishlist series and Crystal Kite winner, Just Like Rube Goldberg. Sarah also teaches classes for the Highlights Foundation and serves as PAL coordinator for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. She's here tonight to share some essential tips about writing for children and teens with all of us. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. I will turn it over to you now. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Solomon. I'm so happy to be here. Um, greetings from Evanston, Illinois. Um, it's raining just a little bit and windy just a little bit more than that. Today, we are gonna talk about um, 10 tips for finding the child's eye. Um, which is my way of sort of saying, what is this whole field of writing for children and young adults? To begin, I would like you to start by thinking about yourself as a child. It can be any age. You can think of yourself as a young child, as a middle schooler, as a teenager. What were the stories that you remember? The events that made you who you are? The signposts that you would look and look back and say, those are the events that made me the person I am today. When you were young, what did you want? When you were young, how did you see the world? What did you fear? What did you yearn for? As you grew older, what are the things you've discovered about yourself? Um, this may sound a little bit like therapy. And sometimes I think that that's exactly what writing is, a very slow therapy. But it is where I start when I think about writing a book for children or teens. Because when I'm writing for that audience, 
Um, I'm not just writing about kids. I'm not taking my camera as an adult and shining them on children of today. What I'm actually doing is entering the world of the child. I'm seeing the world through the child's eyes, through their hearts, from their points of view. This is not a simple process. So a little bit um, about me and how I started doing this, just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from and how I came to this. I started writing on a dare. I was a physical therapist and an exercise um, teacher. Um, I actually worked for um, Jack LaLanne for, um, at the beginning of my career. See how many of you um, know who that is. Not everybody does. When I tell kids I work for Jack LaLanne, they just glaze over. They're like, who is that? They don't even remember Richard Simmons. Um, anyway, I was teaching an exercise class on spinning bikes and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you're pretty funny you should write a book. I went home, not really taking it very seriously, and my children were reading. They were big readers. Um, Rebecca was reading Esperanza Rising, and Elliot was reading a book called Benicula um, about a vampire rabbit. I think he read that book about 100 times that year. Um, I looked at those stories, and I thought about the stories of my childhood mostly Harriet the Spy, still one of my all-time favorite books. I remember reading this book and thinking to myself, I want to be a spy. And I remember getting a book, a notebook, like this one. This was actually my very first journal. And I started writing and telling stories and spying on my parents. Um, this is the very first story I ever wrote called Little Mew, about a cat that played basketball. In any case, I started writing. I really thought about it that much. And, um, and it was not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Those short stories, those simple, heartfelt stories, those stories that I remembered from my childhood, the stories that were changing how my children we're seeing the world and opening their eyes. We're like little gems, mostly because those authors seem to understand what it was like to be a child right now. So let's get into this. Tip number one, what kind of book are you writing? Who are you writing for? With children's literature, there are lots of choices, and I like to choose them all. Um, so this is, there are picture books, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, the parameters of a children's book with illustrations are um, that it should, it's usually under a thousand words, really usually under 500 words these days. Very short picture books are the rage right now. Um, I love showing people the illustrations of these of my book. Um, these illustrations were made by Robert Newbecker, and kids like to ask me how many times I have spoken to Robert Newbecker so that we could get glorious pictures like this one and glorious pictures like this one. And um, you may think that um, over the four years it took to make that book, that we probably talked a um, hundred times, but we actually have never spoken. Um, part of the job of the writer is to write the words and then hand it over to the other brain, the illustrator, who depicts the picture book. So that's one kind of book. There are chapter books and middle grade novels, like this book or like this book. And these books are, you, you know, um, Real novels, fat enough, usually between 40 and 50,000 words, usually um, a child, uh, centering around a child around the age of 10 to 12. Um, we could talk about the age of 13 at some point. Um, for some reason, lots of books, they shy away from 13. 
I am not sure why. Um, these books usually have more hope than impediment. And we'll talk about that later on in terms of scene structure. And then there's young adult, um, young adult books. Um, and these books usually have more impediment than they have hope and progress and often end with some irony. Um, this was my first book, Headcase, about um, my version of the Scarlet Letter about a teenager who um, is guilty of manslaughter and ends up um, um, paralyzed from the neck down. Um, those were the, he is an amalgam of many of the people that I worked with when I was a physical therapist. Um, so knowing who you're writing for and knowing um, what those parameters, what that genre will um, accept are part of the uh, decision-making process when you sit down to write a book. Um, obviously, picture books um, are meant to be read um, with parents often, how lovely, but also independently. As, we, as the books get older, um, they are meant to be read by the child alone. Um, middle grade novels are used in school, um, which is a good reason um, to keep um, some of the language um, less provocative and with teenagers, more, more provocative is better. Although there are books that break the rules. So we'll just start with a little reading of this book. Um, this is a Newbery Honor book of this year, Fighting Words by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. It's a middle grade book, which means the main character is 10 and um, people are reading this in school. And let's just see just how amazing our readers are. Our young kids are so amazing that this is the kind of book they're ready for. Um, my new tattoo is covered by a Band-Aid, but halfway through recess, the Band-Aid falls off. I'm hanging my winter coat on the hook in our fourth grade classroom when my teacher, Mrs. Devante, walks by and gasps. Della, she says, is that a tattoo? I hold up my wrist to show it to her. It's an ampersand, I say, careful to pronounce the word correctly. I know that, Miss Devante says. Is it real? It's so real, it still hurts. And the skin around it is red and puffy. Yes, ma'am, I say. So already really interesting, tough topics. This is a book about abuse. This is a book about sisterhood. Um, it's a beautiful book. Made me cry. Know who you're writing for. And respect our readers. Our young people are great readers. Tip number two. Stories are about change. Um, they're, the protagonist in children's literature is a character that is going to is changing, coming of age, overcoming obstacles. You have to get to know that character. That is job number one. So the first most important step you can take is to is to get into that head, figure out what they want and why they want it. I also like to think about the burdens that kids carry when they when a book begins, um, the hardships they have already undergone, or what we call the misbeliefs a character might have. Um, those misbeliefs are, um, don't necessarily have to be accurate, but they have to be true for, the, for that protagonist. They, that, that protagonist has to see the world in a certain way. Think about it, that is the magic of any book, is to see the character's world as they see it and only as they see it. Sound good? Um, one exercise that I like to do um, when I am first trying to get to know my main character is I ask a very simple question and then I answer it ooh, about 15 times at first, but I'm gonna keep going and keep asking that question throughout the writing process so that I can understand who this character is. And that question is, 
Who are you? Um, try it out. If you have a character you're thinking about, write down the ways that you would define that character or the ways that character would introduce themselves to you. Who is this character? Are they a sister or a brother? Do they have living parents or are their parents gone? Are their fa is their family divorced? Um, where do they live? What grade are they in? You need to know everything about that kid and then how that kid is gonna see the world. Front desk. From page one, I'm not gonna ruin any books for anybody. So I'm only gonna read from page one. Um, from page one, you can see that this, who this kid is. My parents told me that America would be this amazing place where we could live in a house with a dog, do whatever we want and eat hamburgers till we were red in the face. So far, the only part of that we've achieved is the hamburger part. But I was still holding out hope and the hamburgers here were pretty good. So you can see this is a book with a very spunky voice, lots more optimism, not so sure about socioeconomics yet. All those things come into play. So who are you is the first question. Think about how you meet people in real life. When I first meet somebody, I let them know right away that I'm a writer, mostly because the minute people find out, they, um, they have lots of questions and it makes it easier to have a first conversation. But also that's an easy thing to share. I'm a sister, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter. Those are easy things to share and, and we feel comfortable sharing them. But once you get to know somebody better, you get to know, you get to know them more deeply and you get to know all those squishy things about people. So once I get to know my characters, I start to see their underbelly and their fears and some things that maybe in the beginning they're not so interested in telling me. When I was working on Beyond Lucky, I knew right away that I was gonna write a book about a kid who is superstitious, that he, um, that he believes in luck, thus the title. But what I didn't know until many drafts in was that this child, this young boy, was also fearful. He had a brother who was a smoke jumper. He was also fearful of not keeping up with his friends. And he was starting to realize that one of his best friends was perhaps not treating him very well. Those things didn't come until draft four or five I think I actually wrote this book 37 times before it sold. Um, but those layers were worth it. And every time I got deeper, I saw the world through Ari's eyes. And I was able to gather more, more glimmers about his world, more glimmers about his family, more glimmers about his friends and his situation and how he would change. Endings of novels for children and adults as well. Um, are, are, I like the most when they are both surprising and inevitable. When you see a book with a cover like this, you know there are gonna be some soccer games and you suspect there might be a championship, but there's a surprise involved that you don't see coming. Um, well, maybe the astute reader does, but, um, but that's part of the fun of reading is anticipating and kids totally feel that way. All right, I'm gonna take a pause. Any questions about finding a protagonist or getting to know your protagonist or thinking about a child protagonist? Put in the chat. If not, I will keep going. Um, tip number three. Your protagonist does not live alone. There are also secondary characters and their job is to illuminate the journey of change that your character's character is going through. 
I love secondary characters. And literally, I could talk about them for the next seven hours because they um, they do what they it's what they do. They illuminate the journey of the main character, the strengths and the weaknesses. Often, the most important secondary characters also go through journeys of change themselves. Although sometimes um, they're they're bit players. You got to think like a director. Sometimes you're going to have really important secondary characters, but your cast needs those other kind of characters too. When I'm looking at secondary characters, um, I have a lot of fun thinking about why they're there, their relationship to the protagonist, and what I want to say. The secondary characters can also help me illuminate a theme. And they always come, oh, most of the time, from my own experience. So again, think about your life when you were a child. Think about that best friend or, oh, that, that friend who let you down or that boy who never paid attention to you or your mom who had high hopes or a teacher or a rabbi or a priest or a minister. Our worlds are populated with other people, and those people are going to have an interesting effect on your main character. Um, my favorite example of a great secondary character, well, that's not true. It, well, two favorite stories. My favorite story about this one is that this book, in the beginning, was always going to be about sisters. Um, I have a sister who was always really good at everything. And um, I found that very annoying because I had a lot of trouble, especially in school. So when I started writing this book, I really wanted to write about a girl who's going to have trouble in school, in this case, fairy godmother training, and with a sister who was great at everything. When, my, when Miriam's son, Aaron, read this book, he looked at me and said, you're dissing my mom. Memories work that way. Um, we get to play with them when we're writing for children. Um, Clotilda in this, in this series is a great character who is going to change by the end of the book. She's in every single book and she plays an important role. In Beyond Lucky, the character of Parker Llewellyn was originally a boy. I looked at the scenes that he was in and he was not doing anything interesting. He was garnering no tension. So I um, did that who are you exercise. And one of the things I discovered was that he was really obsessed with being perfect. And then I thought, and I looked at my own kids and I thought about who's obsessed with being perfect. I realized it was my daughter and I changed Parker to a girl and that character began to just sing. So I think that what I really want to say about these two things about protagonists and secondary characters is that you should play and be flexible. Think of the child's world and who the child interacts with um, and, and have a good time with it. And don't be afraid to change your mind. A book takes many, many drafts, as we all know. Um, it's really important to, um, to be able to change your mind to um, serve the story. Remember, story is the boss. So if it serves the story, it's good. Tip number four, what is important to you? This is where we get to actually be adults here. Um, think about the ideas in, the, in your life that are exciting to you. It's not that you're going to teach any kid a message or a lesson. That is not what children's literature is meant to do. And in fact, when I read a really didactic book as a teacher, I have to pull the writer aside and say, nope, this is not what we're writing for. We're writing to show change. We're writing to engage children in a discourse about big ideas. Things that I write about creativity, family, 
grief, forgiveness. These themes are, 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 are what is behind the engine, what is behind the motivation of what some of my characters will do. Um, I think about three backstories that I like to play with. I think about where I got the idea for the story. Mm, that always tells me something about what I was thinking about. The other day I was um, walking by Lake Michigan and um, there were a bunch of girls hanging around. They were all wearing their masks. I was very happy to see that. And, um, and one girl was sitting by herself. And I thought, that is a story. That is a story I'm being gifted. Why is that girl sitting by herself? I went home and began to journal. Where your story begins often says something about you. I also think about the backstory of the main character. I ask lots of questions and I've given you a handout, you'll get it tomorrow, that is filled with lots of questions that you can ask your characters and ask your story and ask yourself. Again, one of the most important questions I ask is what burdens are you carrying when you enter this book? What has happened to you? With secondary characters, I think, hmm, how long have these two people been friends? Why are they friends? What keeps their friendship alive? Why are they motivated to hang out together? Because of course, you know, in childhood, friendships change a great deal. So those kinds of questions about the backstory of the characters also fuel my ideas for what I want to say. And then of course, there's our backstory. Again, thinking about our lives as children. I can tell you that a lot of my stories, um, when I'm writing, I think about who I was in first grade. In first grade, I lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's the Christmas city and I am Jewish and everybody knew it because there were no Christmas decorations on our house and pe people felt awkward about that. Um, I remember in first grade walking down the street to go to school. It was three blocks away and one busy street, but there was a crossing guard there, a sixth grader. And that sixth grader knew that I was Jewish. And so he stopped me from crossing and said, um, Jews cross last. This could have been, I mean, it was a terrible thing. And this could have hurt my spirit, but I accepted it. And I was just late every single day for school until one day my teacher called my parents and said, could you get your kid up a little bit earlier? My parents probably kicked me out of the house an hour before school started. Um, I was the oldest, <laughs> so they were really happy to get rid of one. And um, they pulled me into the living room and said, what is going on? Are you just dawdling? And I told them what was happening. And um, their solution was that I should walk another way. Why I tell you the story is because in all of my books, when I'm thinking about my characters, I think about that little girl. I did not walk another way. I was late every day that year. That kid did not get in trouble either, just saying. I stood there and waited stubbornly and persistently. Um, I was not going to be invisible. And that really speaks to so many chapters in my life. And when I'm looking at my characters, I look at them and think, when do you want to be invisible? And when do you not? And how are you like that girl standing on the edge? Now let's talk about writing the process. Um, tip number five, I believe that, um, Writing is a process of three eyes. And so this will be tips five, six, and seven. Inspiration, intuition, and intellect. Intuition is the magic part. Sometimes I have no idea where the ideas come from, but I'm going to be open to finding them. 
I believe that if we have learned one thing during this time of COVID, it's that we have all been multitasking way too much and that the phone, the evil phone, which we love so much, is making us so busy that we're missing opportunities for creativity. So I've been trying very hard to open my eyes and close off the noise and spend a good part of each day looking for inspiration. Ways that I like to do this. Sometimes I start by just, um, if, if anybody has read Linda Berry, um, I think, I mean, she is a, she's actually, she has a genius grant. So everyone knows she's a genius. She speaks a lot about the creative process and getting into the, getting into the mind of your character. So because of her, I've begun starting every day by drawing a swirly as close as I can um, and as long as I can until my mind, so I've tuned out the world and I've zoned into my story and my ideas and my emotions because of course story has an active plot and it also has an internal plot. And that is true for children's literature as well as adult literature. Um, I also doodle a lot um, or draw squares or try morning pages. I start with the pencil to the page. Um, when I'm making a, um, a picture book, this is really important. Here is my next book. Um, it's called Brand New Bubby. And it's about a girl whose mom um, gets married, remarried. And so she gets a third grandma and she's not too psyched. Um, so I spend a lot of time writing, handwriting my books and then pasting them into what we call a dummy. And sometimes I even try drawing. This kind of exercise gets me away from that um, multitasking urge, gets me off the Twitter where maybe I will compare myself to other writers. It even gets me away um, from the news, which is like in the last four years, yeah, get away from the news. Um, and helps me find new ideas. Um, okay. Tip six, intuition. Once you have some ideas, putting them together is a really important skill. I like to make outlines or storyboards where I draw pictures and embrace what is happening actively as well as um, in the heart and head of the character. Um, that intuition helps me put together things that I'm not sure how they're working together yet. I um, play around a lot with um, order um, and structure. Um, and also I'm trying to be flexible. I am a writer who um, starts with a discovery draft and then I delete it because um, I think that my darlings get in my way. So I try to um, understand Use that intuition to put things together. And then intellect. This is the easiest part of writing, the thinking part. Once you have words on the page, you can think about logic and scene structure and all the really excellent things that come when you have written words and you have something on the page. Um, I like to think like a director in terms of scenes, in terms of actions, in terms of actions and reactions in both my work with children's books and now that I'm working on a book about an adult. Um, all of that is um, really, really essential. Any questions about, do you have questions about writing in general, about creating a structure for a story, about what the structure of a children's book is versus um, an adult book. Any questions? I can't be explaining everything. It's impossible. 
Um, one of the things I love looking at when I'm thinking about structure are graphic novels because they're essentially storyboards for me. I love looking at the pictures of how we move through story, um, how we see a character's growth. Um, I'm glad. Um, thinking like a director also means that you get to step away from your manuscript and think about um, what each scene is doing and how it is pushing the story forward. I feel like um, stories are like vectors. They have energy, they move forward. Your characters respond to what is going on. Um, there's a great quote by Annie Dillard that I put in your handout that essentially says um, that you should spend it all, that you should not hold anything back, that you shouldn't pace yourself waiting for that reveal. I think we all learn this um, we all learn this through experience. When I was writing Believe, this book is about a girl who is the sole survivor of the suicide bombing. And it takes place 10 years after that event. Both of her parents were killed in the blast. And now she is, um, I was inspired by baby Jessica. I bet everyone knows who she was, that baby in the well. Um, I found this story when I was sitting in the hairdresser, getting my color done, reading People Magazine. And there was an article about baby Jessica, where she is now. And I found out that at 21, she had a baby and she married someone in jail. And I was like, baby Jessica, you were saved from the well for this. And then like I went, because one, that's inappropriate. Um, two, who am I? And three, baby Jessica didn't ask for all this fame. And then I thought, I'm gonna write a book about that. Um, oftentimes my kids will say, if I'm harping too much on one theme, they're like, just mom, please write a book about that. Anyway, um, Janine, my main character, um, has been holding on to her mother's final journal. Her mother was a journalist um, and that's why they were in Israel. And um, she's never read it, but at some point in this book, she feels ready to take a look at it. In the first draft, I parsed out those journal entries so that at the end of the book, she would realize something about her parents that she never realized before. And it all made perfect sense and that was great. And that was the most boring book I've ever written. My editor said, she's gonna have to read the whole thing and then respond. You cannot save that reveal for later. You must spend it all. And so I encourage all of you to spend it. Um, kid readers um, are not gonna put up with um, a book that's only, that has just has beautiful metaphors or, um, you know, is indulging itself in lots of descriptions and dawdling. Um, kid readers want a story, and um, and I do too. And so, um, if we spend it, we're going to find things that we never thought were possible. I think that that trust, that trust in ourselves as adults writing for children, um, is so important to the creation of a book. We, we know that it's gonna end up okay, but we have to be in there in the moment with that same heart palpitating fear that it's not going to um, with our characters. I mean, of course, trust is a huge part of every writing process because we start a book and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, so persistence is really, really important too. And, um, I always find it easier when I'm writing some about something that means a lot to me because books take a long time to make. Tip number eight, let's talk about dialogue. Um, I love dialogue. I, had a, I was a kid who had a hard time concentrating on books. Um, I would look at a book 
It has lots and lots of words, and I don't think I ever would even start that book. Um, dialogue is also your chance to have all of your characters um, saying what they want. You can get to know a person through dialogue and action. You don't really always need to know their innermost thoughts. Um, I, I, I love scenes that show us, don't tell us. Um, about the characters. One of my favorite books from this year is The List of Things That Will Not Change by um, Newbery winner, Rebecca Stead. Um, if you, um, um, her, now I'm having a senior moment, um, her award-winning book, look her up. It's amazing. Anyway, in this book, B, um, B's family, B's parents have divorced. And, um, and B's dad is getting ready to marry Jesse, um, his, um, his boyfriend. And Jesse has brought his, um, his family, um, his daughter, Sonia, um, to um, spend some time with them. B is missing her mom. Um, some, we, we know lots of things about her. I want to read this to you just so you can hear how much you can show in a scene without explaining anything. In this scene, B um, has just gone to see Miriam, her therapist. Dad was waiting for me outside Miriam's office, not in mom's usual waiting room chair, but on the other side of the room. I looked at the little table where mom always piled her students' papers. And I told dad I wanted to call her. He nodded and handed me his phone. Mom's number was already ringing. I sat down in her chair. She answered, Daniel, it's me, I said. Hi, sweetie, hi. Are you at Miriam's? Yeah. Everything good? Yeah. I just wanted to say hi. Hi. How are things going with Sonia? Good. I tried to think of something to tell her. I said, we went to the museum. We saw the armor. Oh, fun. How's school going? Good. It's good to hear your voice, honey, mom said. Yeah. Dad was holding my coat. After I said goodbye to mom and gave him his phone back, he put my arms into my coat sleeves the way he did when I was little. It felt good. He zipped me up and tucked my hair into my hood. Ready, he said. Ready, I told him. Ah, I love that scene. I love that scene because she does not explain that mom usually takes her there. She could have. She could have put that into the interior monologue. But she didn't. Instead, she trusted the reader to understand that when she said, not in mom's usual waiting chair, that was enough. The reader knows mom usually takes her to Miriam's. Also, the dad and mom are in this together. Again, we don't need lots of explanations. Here, we know that that's true because dad is already calling mom even before B asks him to. Um, we also know that he realizes that she's in a vulnerable moment because he puts my, her arms into her coat sleeves the way he did when she was little. This is a beautiful example of a book for children that trusts and honors young readers um, with beautiful prose, big emotions, um, and not too much grown-up ex grown explanation or lessons. And certainly we could all go there. Dialogue for me has three layers. There's the things that people say, um, the things in between the quotation marks, so important, especially for reluctant readers, new readers, to hear other people's voices, um, to see that white space. Let's, let's be honest dialogue reads faster. There's also the stuff that's not said. 
that often um, is, is um, due to backstory. People who have known each other a long time, there are things they don't need to say to each other. Um, also stuff that um, would be an info dump. Um, the author jumping in and, um, and telling the reader what they need to know. And then there's the unsayable stuff, the stuff that we never want to say. And that is the magic that the author can add to the story because readers infer. All of us are readers. We all know how that works. We look at gestures. We look at taglines. We look at action in between what people are saying. And we infer. One of the things that took me a long time to understand about writing was that I couldn't be sure that every reader would understand every single thing that I wanted them to grasp. Um, I let that go. That me, the control freak, I let it go. When I was in theater, the fourth wall was so important to me. I wanted to hear people laughing or gasping or clapping when I was singing or saying the lines just the right way. As authors, we do not have that opportunity to hear our audiences laughing. With children, that means that there is a tendency when you're writing for young people to explain too much so that you can control how they will feel. Let me just say right here, you can invite these young readers to the emotional journey, to the emotional arena, but our job is not to teach them. Our job is just to invite them there and let them finish the book. Let them infer what they think is going on. Let them um, complete the story. That is how we change the world. That is how we give our world hope. That is how we make great humans, by introducing them to a lot of different kinds of people doing a lot of different things. I think it's an amazingly and wildly ambitious um, goal, but we must do it. We must reach. If any of you are yoga people, I'm a yoga person, also a Peloton person these days. I love that Peloton. When I'm doing yoga, there's a position called standing bow pose. Standing bow, you, li you lift one arm, you grab your leg from behind in the other arm, and then you reach forward and you pull your leg back. And I fall out of it every single time, no matter how strong I'm getting. And usually the yogi will say, if you kick hard enough, you can stand there forever. And I used to feel like a failure when I didn't stand there forever. But here's the thing I've learned about my writing as well as my standing bow pose is that it does not hurt to fall and that I'm going to fall. I'm gonna fail many times. And that that, that, but what I need to do is to reach farther, to reach harder, to reach for things I don't even think that I am ready to write to be ambitious, um, that's when I'm gonna find the genius. That's when I'm gonna find my story is when I'm, when I'm losing my balance. That was tip number eight. Tip number nine, um, this is a community. None of us write alone. Find yourself a critique group, people who understand the parameters of children's literature and can help you make your book better. When I first started writing Rube, this was my very first um, picture book biography. I did not know very much about that. So I started reading. That's another big tip. Read in your genre. I gave it to friends who were writing this kind of book. Um, I did the research. I changed the words. I was flexible. I tried to do the best job I could, and I was lucky because that's another part of writing is that luck keeps 
Luck is part of it. Just for um, just for kicks, this is the um, the draft of Just Like Rube Goldberg that was sold, and you could see the editor already had lots of things she had to say. Editing is something that you um, only stop doing when they finally make the book. Tip number ten is um, my message uh, is um, my message and the world's message right now. Diversity in children's literature has never been more important. We need stories that feature kids with all kinds of skin colors, from all kinds of backgrounds, from all kinds of cultures. And those stories are best written by people who have experienced, who represent those identities. Um, so if you are a person, um, with you are a person, <laughs> you have a story, you have an identity, your own voice is needed. Kids need to see these stories. They're yearning for them. Um, populate your stories with a diverse cast of characters. As a white Jewish writer, I try to have characters of color in my stories. Um, that are, that, that are important to the story so that kids can see that it, we do not live in an all white world. We don't, and our books should reflect that. Um, writing is a very um, hard activity. <laughs> um, it takes kindness to yourself, just like being a fairy godmother. Where's my book? To be a great fairy godmother, you need three things. You need kindness. As writers, we need kindness too. Kindness to ourselves when we fail. Kindness to others so that we can understand what their lives are like. Kindness is empathy. No time in our lives has empathy been more important than right now. We really need to see the world through the eyes of others as well as ourselves. Two, determination. All of these books took many drafts to write. All of these books I could have put in a drawer and I have put books in a drawer, a lot of them, um, when they weren't working. But persistence pays off. Please use your writing friends. Please don't give up. Please give yourself the time and space to fail and then to succeed. And last, to be a great fairy godmother and to be a great writer, especially for kids, you need some gusto. Kids don't know what gusto is and I like to act it out, gusto. But gusto for me means confidence and creativity, empowerment. Books are not a lesson, but we do have something to share with young readers. We do have a lot of things to show the world. And in these books, we can do that. From picture book, to graphic novel, to middle grade novel, fiction, nonfiction, stories from our world here, from made up worlds, from worlds across the sea. Um, all we ask is that you keep trying. Um, I always like to end all of my classes with um, a poetry reading because I think that um, one of the things I like to do is to be in touch with language. So this is um, this, the poem I've been reading every morning for the last three, four months as I work on my newest book, um, Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. Um, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, 
No matter how lonely the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Um, I hope you have some questions. I would love to answer them. Um, it's been my pleasure to make this presentation and um, I can't wait till we can all be together again. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. Was um, fun. <laughs> while we wait uh, for questions to come in, I have a question. Go for um, it. So, you know, one, one argument that we hear a lot that I strongly disagree with is that, um, you know, when, you, when, an, when an adult hits a certain age, you lose your imagination. And uh, going along with that misconception, you know, would you say it's easier to write for children because their imaginations are more open because they're younger? Or how do you feel okay. about that? You know, I think that, um, that as adults, we have forgotten how to play. This is a, I talk about this a lot, that we forget how to play the way kids do. And that as adult writers for children's literature, we need to return to play, not because our, the topics are juvenile, but because that is how we can reawaken that imagination and reawaken our creativity and our curiosity in a playful sort of way, in that child's way. So knowing who you were as a child is one portal. Reading books about children is another portal. Doodling is a portal. That's like, when I draw, I'm not drawing because I'm good at it. I'm drawing because it helps me get out of my own way. So like, here's a map. This is a map of where I grew up. Um, Sometimes I draw this map just to remind myself um, exactly how I was feeling. This is an access point, a portal to how to my old emotions. Sometimes I get lazy and I draw the elephant from behind. I learned how to draw the elephant from behind. <laughs> and I was like, it's like second grade. And if somebody asks me to draw something and I'm feeling lazy, that's what I draw. And um, so sometimes for me, that's the symbol of no creativity. It's like, oh, you're taking the easy way out. Don't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, someone put in the chat, um, where does an adult get the imagination to create a colorful children's world? Um, so from you, start with you. Start with your imagination, your child's eye, and then go out into the world Put your phone down and look around and find the beauty that is in our world. Find the irony in our world. Find the tragedy in our world. See what sparks your imagination. Children's books essentially are just books. They're books with a child protagonist and with child characters in it. But they're about all the things that adult books are about. They're about love and friendship and family. As I work on my first adult book, look how sad it is. I, um, that, um, that, that I have found that like my main character, she may be 74, but she yearns for things just like this little fairy godmother does. Our hearts, our beating hearts are the, are the essential element, our yearning our memories, our imaginations are the essential element that will help us enter this world. Read a bunch of books, they're all different. Children's literature is some of the best books I've read, been written for children. Thank you. Uh, while we are waiting to see if any more questions come through for Sarah, um, I'm going to uh, give one more reminder for our workshop, the next workshop. Um, our next workshop um, will be on March 31st. Um, it's going to be Writing Your Memoir with Param Parastarin. Um, so be sure to register for that one. And I realized that I did not put um, the link 
in the chat for the pandemics as a portal to change. So I will share that right now. So you have access to it. Okay, that has been shared. Cool. Well, I don't see any more questions coming through, but there was a, a comment. Thank you for a wonderful talk. So inspiring and practical. And I agree. A really good webinar. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am um, excellent. I'm glad you're pumped up, Gail. Um, I am too. I love talking about craft. Um, if you are, if you have a manuscript and you are looking for, um, for a community, the Highlights Foundation is a great place to start. Um, you can learn all about their courses online as well as hopefully soon in person. Um, and there, there are scholarships available. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. All right. Well, we will see everyone at the next workshop. Thank you for coming and have a good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.